Another kind of apophenia is, this, uh, is a similar to the hyperactive agency detector, but here is the hyperactive causation detector. And uh, I think uh, I can best explain what I mean by that by reference to some experiments that um, Skinner did in the, uh, the, the B.F. Skinner, the, behavior, the behaviorist, with some pigeons, which Dawkins, Richard Dawkins explains here in this... Uh, All wild animals have to be kind of natural statisticians looking for patterns in the apparent randomness of nature when they're looking for food or trying to avoid predators. There are two kinds of mistakes they can make. They can either fail to detect pattern when there is some, or they can seem to detect pattern when there isn't any, and that's superstition. Sixteen years ago, the American psychologist B.F. Skinner investigated the behavior of pigeons, rewarding them with food when they learned to peck a key in the feeding apparatus. But then, Skinner set the apparatus to reward the birds at random. Now the pigeons just had to sit back and wait. But that isn't what they did. Instead, the majority developed what Skinner called superstitious behavior. When an individual pigeon, for example, happened to look over its left shoulder, and the reward mechanism just happened to click in at that point, it would have got the idea that it was looking over the left shoulder that had got it the reward, so it tried it again. By sheer luck, as it happened, the reward mechanism delivered food at the same time again. And so the pigeon was reinforced in its idea that looking over the left shoulder was what got it the reward. And it went on and on and turned into a maniac looking over the left shoulder. Humans can be no better than pigeons. So, <laughs> so I think again, this would be a case of apophenia. We're looking. We're, uh, why? Because again, uh, natural selection has favoured uh, a brain that tends towards type one errors rather than type two errors. It may be better to be superstitious than to miss genuine causal patterns. That are there. Causal, causation is notoriously difficult to separate from chance association anyway. That's why we have to develop incredibly sophisticated statistical tests to be able to distinguish between random and non-random pat patterns and, and uh, pick out genuine causation from mere chance correlation. If it's difficult enough for statisticians to do that, it's much more difficult for, human, for individual human beings 100,000 years ago without the benefit of uh, symbol, uh, external symbols operating on very small sample sizes. So given that, it may be better to carry around a whole bunch of superstitions which are relatively harmless rather and just because that allows you to pick on pick up on some of the genuine causal patterns that are there and that are incredibly valuable if you pick them up. So that's why I think they're normally hyperactive, by which I mean why, they're norm why our causation detectors are biased towards type 1 errors. So two types of apophenia then that I think may underlie our tendencies, natural tendencies to be religious. There are individual differences in apophenia as well, of course, and it does seem that believers in the paranormal, according to an interesting study by um, Peter Brugger in 2002, believers in the paranormal are more likely than skeptics to see faces that aren't there. So when he generated a whole bunch of random patterns and asked people if they could see faces in them or not, and some genuine faces were, were mixed in with the noise and some weren't, and then he looked at people who made the type 1 error and then asked them to complete a survey. Do they believe in the paranormal and so on? Measure their degree of belief in the paranormal. The tendency to see the faces that aren't there correlated very strongly with the tendency to believe in the paranormal. So it may be that these, there's a, you know, we're all biased towards these type 1 errors, but some of us are more biased than others. 
and the more biased you are in those, and that's as a general personality trait that underlies a whole range of, phenom of uh, attitudes from belief in the paranormal to religious belief <coughs> to seeing faces that aren't there and so on. But it should follow then that if, uh, if believers in the paranormal are more likely to commit type 1 errors than skeptics, then skeptics should be more likely to commit type 2 errors than believers, and that is indeed also what they found. So when he looked at the number of, Brugger looked at the number of type 2 errors, in other words, how many people uh, failed to spot a face that was really there, he found that skeptics were more likely to miss the real faces that were there than the believers in the paranormal. He also has gone on to administer l -Dopa, which is uh, usually used in medicine to uh, treat Parkinson's disease. It boosts the amount of dopamine in the brain. When he administered l -Dopa to the skeptics, he found that it made them less skeptical. In other words, it made them more e likely to say later that they did believe in the paranormal and more likely to see the faces that weren't there. In other words, to commit type 2 errors. So, he suggests that paranormal thoughts are associated with high levels of dopamine in the brain, and indeed that fits with a very, the strongest hypothesis that we have at the moment for, about schizophrenia, which is the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, which argues that schizophrenia is associated with abnormally high levels of dopamine in the brain. So my suggestion is if you really want to increase the level of atheism in society, I suggest that we put a dopamine antagonist in the water supply. It's the fastest way to do it. Okay, so moving on from apophenia to memorable anomalies, the, another one of the sort of cognitive forces, I think, that uh, tend to favor religious belief. By this, uh, what I mean is I'm referring to an idea developed by the French uh, cognitive anthropologist Pascal Boyer. Um, he's written a number of books about it, in which he develops this idea that the people tend to classify things into fundamental categories, and these may be innate. So we have you know, categories, fundamental ways of dividing up the world. There are, a whole, there are you know, a fundamental ontology, if you like, or metaphysics that we're born with, uh, independently of culture. And we classify the world as sort of basic categories like people, plants, animals, tools, and, and so on. There's a very, very limited number of these basic categories here. And he argues that these fundamental categories come with a bunch of default assumptions. So people have thoughts and feelings and intentions and, and so on. Uh, tools uh, are defined by the task that they are designed to do they, and so on. They don't have thoughts and they don't, can't speak and so on. And he argues that uh, when something violates just one or two of the default assumptions about the fundamental category it belongs to, it becomes then what he calls a memorable anomaly. Okay? If something is just an absolutely standard exemplar of the category it belongs to, it's not particularly memorable. Okay? It's, uh, you know, if an act is just a normal act, it's just a normal act. There's nothing massively memorable about it. If it violates loads of, uh, of, the fundamental, of, of the default assumptions of the category it belongs to, it's just too weird to even make sense of. We don't even pay attention to it. We don't remember it. It's just bizarre. We don't discount it. But if it violates just one or two uh, category, uh, default assumptions, then it suddenly becomes a lot more memorable. So an axe that uh, is green that nah, not particularly memorable. An axe that talks, aha, that's an interesting idea. So he suggests that these memorable anomalies, because they're, they're memorable, they, stay, they're, they have a kind of sticky quality. They stay around in the mind and they, if, if someone comes up with them, they tend to remember them more frequently than they would do uh, uh, any of the other kinds of uh, thing. They're more likely to talk about them, they're more likely to be remembered and so on. Now, a lot of, he argues that a lot of the uh, standard uh, tropes in, in religious mythology have these exactly, meet these criteria of being a memorable anomaly. Spirits, for example, they have all the normal things that people have, it, but they don't have bodies. 
That's a really interesting, memorable idea, okay? Because it violates one of the default assumptions about people, which is that people have bodies, okay? Uh, or that people have cognitive limitations, okay? We, it not, there's these things called gods. They're like people, but they don't have bodies, and they know everything, okay? There's violating just one or two uh, default assumptions, and so it's more memorable. Uh, there's an inter another interesting idea, a third kind of uh, uh, tendency which famous religious belief is uh, advanced by the psychologist Paul Bloom in a fascinating book called Descartes' Baby.